You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 108, an interview with Chris Mahan of Mahan & Associates. This week on The Dental Guys, we discuss why we choose in our practices to recommend a dental-specific accountant. But John, it's more than just choosing an accountant. It's about understanding what numbers matter. That's right. We get into a little bit about that on this episode and a lot more this week on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. Well, welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. I'm John, The Dental Guy. Here we are again, John, in the home studio of um, Wes, The Dental Guy. That's right. It's rare, as we've said before, to be recording this at the same time in the same place. Mm -hmm. Uh, Normally, we're in our own places, but we're doing some collaborative work today, so it was a good time to to uh, also get some work done with the show. Yeah, collaboration is always a good thing. Absolutely. And we had some good coffee uh, to Mm. start it off, uh, which was awesome. And uh, uh, this episode that we're uh, going to have, uh, you're going to get the the privilege to listen to today, I say that because our our guest is, I think, really worth listening to, is very different than what we've been doing. You know, we just are in the midst of the zero bone loss concepts, uh, uh, you know, discussion. We're about uh, halfway through that book, um, and uh, man, pretty intense clinical stuff we're talking about. But we felt like this is a good time to release this episode, and there'll be another additional one coming because we're going to be talking about uh, a topic that here it is in the new year, and everybody is thinking about how they did last year, mm. right? Everybody's hopefully is looking back. How was 2019? How were my numbers? Um, how was production? How are our write-offs? Should I drop PPOs forever? Should I, you know, uh, t- should I quit being a dentist because I didn't make any money? <laughs> or sh- am I, you know, do I have made so much money that I'm, you know, going to buy a private island? And so now we're thinking, how did we do? And and then second is we're preparing for tax season. Mm. How much money do I need to have in my bank account so that I can afford to pay my taxes come April? And so you know, we had both kind of over the years learned sort of the hard way I think mm. about accounting and tax and and you guys know this is not the crux of our show but we when we find somebody like Chris Mahan who we're going to be interviewing today who actually understands what a quality dental practice is supposed to be about not just numbers but actually doing it right um, kind of he just sort of worked well with our feeling, our philosophy about dentistry. Then, I mean, it's a necessary evil. Whether you like business or not, you got to have somebody who understands how, the numbers. And I think that can help to teach our, us and our listeners about the numbers and what really matters. Well, some of these listeners, you know, you have the type of practice that you're wanting to take it to the next level. You want your clinical dentistry to to excel and you come to this show and we always bring this clinical information that we you know talk about so much and taking it to the next level but when does that leave time whenever you're spending so much time on your professional clinical development for the owners listening to this that you can really dive in and you know, no really is my business making money is the clinical dentistry, John, that we bring back from CE. Mm-hmm. Like, is it worth implementing? Right. You know? And we've had episodes on some of the clinical dentistry we've learned over the past five years that is it even business savvy to incorporate that into our practice and, yeah. and a, and a dental specific advisor, mm-hmm. right. Is someone that kind of, that does have a insight, um, from the outside looking in, like, again, we practice inside of a little bit of a vacuum, yeah, right? Yeah, a little As dentist, right? And so, and we don't want to compare ourselves to others, but like, as we talk about in this podcast, it's easy for us to compare. Right. And there's good and bad about that. You know, I think that it's, uh, um, there's a lot of people out there who who will 
get obsessed with that. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to have some of that. You have to have the ability to know what's normal. Mm -hmm. Where am I? Am I am I in the normal range? Am I underperforming? Am I overperforming? What do I need to change? You know, what what do I need to 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 completely overhaul? And then what do I need to feel like I'm doing pretty well? And I think when it comes to, you know, translating clinical dentistry and your knowledge into the business, you have to know where that is. And so we we found that if you speak and the part of the discussion in this episode is going to be why should you talk to somebody who understands dentistry versus right. just an accountant who doesn't really know much about dentistry? They're kind of a general accountant. I don't think it has to be a dentist either that is helping you, right? I think it has to be somebody, or it is recommended to maybe have somebody, in our opinion, because of the things that we've dealt with in a career that has dental knowledge, right? Right, right. right. And and I think there's some healthy. Um, aspects of the fact that, you know, the person advising you isn't a dentist. Right, right. right. But Because business is, you know, driven in a different way than even cl- clinical work. Sure. Right? It's, it's very, very granular. Yeah. There's a lot of, like, granularity to the numbers, and that can get daunting. Right. Um, and you can get kind of bogged down in that a little bit as yep. a dentist because we're so concerned about the minutia, John. Sure. And I think that it's good to have someone outside looking in that has a good global view on, hey, where's dentistry headed, right? Sure. Does is there is there merit to some of the things in your community, like to you know the type of care you're providing? Well, and I think it's too. It's having uh, seen a bunch of other practices to know right. what's working and and what's mm-hmm. not, and that's where you say. So like, you're not what, just asking your friends, right. right? Because when you ask your friends, <clears throat> are they really telling you what you want to hear? There's there's a lot of of posturing, uh, posturing and out out <laughs> out and out lying that goes on when you ask somebody how things are going in their practice. Everybody wants to be good. Everybody wants to say it's going great. And so, you know, somebody question, though, mm, you know, mm -hmm. would you rather ask somebody a question and then give you the answer you didn't want to hear? Or would you rather give them uh, as a person? Would you rather them give you the answer you wanted to hear? Well, I think in in most of these cases, you know, when you ask somebody, hey, how's that working for you? You want them to say it's working great because, you know, say you went to a course and you learned this new technique and you're so jazzed about it and you're like, man, I want to implement that into my practice. If you ask somebody who's doing it, you hope they say, yeah, it's going great because you just spent five grand on this CE course. You better hope that it actually mm-hmm. is a good business move. And But sometimes you need somebody to tell you, you know, I, I looked at that and I tried that or, or somebody's not even a dentist to say, I've seen 50 practices that have tried to implement that and it only worked in five of them. Mm-hmm. And here's the five of them. Here's what they did that seemed to make it work. And so as we get into this interview, I think that's going to be the thing is we want you, our listeners to kind of weigh that out. Uh, to decide, you know, if you're not already working with somebody who knows dentistry, mm. um, decide whether that's a good fit for you and, and, and maybe learn some things that, may, that we didn't even know about um, what somebody brings to the table mm. that has specific knowledge about our field uh, and also understands what comes into running a successful business and not getting put in jail for not paying the right amount of taxes or right. following the rules. Right. I think you guys are going to get a lot of benefit from this. Hey, before we get in, let's kind of change the subject here just a yeah, second yeah. because we had a great conversation over coffee a minute ago, and we talked about going from good to great, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And you, you you brought up a particular thing that we always talk about going hashtag next level, right? Yeah, yeah. What do you think really is required, John, from going good to great as an associate first? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that we were talking about what holds back uh, growth per- personally, I think, and professionally for associates, especially and owners too. Not nah, it's just kind of across the board. But uh, we were talking about the fact that you know a good a good young dentist um, wants to be really good and wants to be great. Hopefully, um, but you know the the kind of what it all distilled down to is I, I, I kind of said that I feel like that the desire to to be great has to be a higher desire than the desire to be right so you know the the, the we all want to be right but but is hopefully the desire to be great is more 
than to be right. We have to be able to admit when we're not right, when we don't know something, because in order to be great, you have to be humble. You have to be able to admit what you don't know. And I think that's what uh, what this, even, even from a business and accounting standpoint, you have to be able to say, hey, right. I really don't know what's right and and uh, I don't I'm, I want to be great but I first have to admit that I don't know exactly what to do here so to be a next level dentist John you're what you're saying if we use deductive reasoning here <laughs> and sometimes it's right and we do right and we do um, that you have to be wrong and yeah, you know be being willing wrong, to be wrong I'll be honest with you, being wrong is hard man right um, and if you're listening to this out there no one wants to to be wrong. I mean, like, if you say you want to be wrong, like, you're lying, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that being wrong is really hard, um, especially when you're challenged by your, your like, right, yeah. your colleague. Sure. So, like, you know, kind of full circle here is, like, when you ask friends, you know, an opinion, they most likely you're going to ask somebody that already lines up with what you think. Yeah. And so I think that surrounding mm. yourself with people – that will tell you what you don't want to hear, mm-hmm. right? Or tell you maybe how you might be wrong. Yeah. That could take you to the next level, right? Oh, absolutely. I think it's been the thing that has always been the biggest changes in a positive way in our practices and our lives, too, has been somebody saying, you know, I, I'm seeing what you're doing, and and I think there's some things we need to change because I think there's a better way. Mm-hmm. Um, or you need to stop doing that because uh, I have some wisdom that I've seen mm. or I've experienced things that might uh, show you that, that the path you're heading down is not end up where you really want to be. Mm. And they sometimes know better where you really want to be even than you do. If you mm. have somebody that really, if, you, if they understand where you're going, it's the same with a good financial advisor. You know, If you've told them what your goals are, they're going to actually hold you to those goals right. and and you might that might hurt sometimes because they're say, they're going to say wait a second you told me you wanted to do this but you're heading in a way that's not going to get you there that's why we want to take a little bit of break for just a moment on clinical dentistry yeah. and allow for some discussion to happen about what uh, what this side of our practices needs to look like because there is nothing that's that's going to make your your clinical dentistry more fun and more successful than having a good business plan for how to actually make that happen. Uh, you know, I, I love at the end of the day being able to talk shop uh, with someone to kind of rehash what we did clinically mm-hmm. and what decisions that have to be made business wise. I feel like that as dentists, we put that on the back burner, maybe because it's not our forte. Yeah. You know, it's not what it's less we, comfortable. It's less comfortable to have that discussion. And I'll be honest with you, I grow as a dentist faster because I have advisors mm-hmm. that can help me make business decisions. And you know, that's hard to do because John, we like to do it all. Sure. I mean we're general dentists. <clears throat> we don't think we can, yeah. You know, and so I think this is a good podcast for you guys, and we're going to take a little bit of break, yeah, from Zero Bone Loss Concepts. Don't think we won't be back. Oh, we're coming back. We're coming back in a big way with the (laughs) second part of Zero Bone Loss Concepts in the near future. And also, stay tuned, because the next episode, we are going to have a very special guest on our show. Yep. Um, And I'm super excited about that, John, and stay tuned for that because that's a big deal yep. for the dental guys and our, our recent association uh, with a particular organization. Yep. And we are super pumped about that. Um, and so right after a word from our sponsor, we're going to get right into this uh, discussion with Chris Mayheim. Hey guys, it's Justin Goodbread here with Financially Simple. So the next area I want you to focus on when growing the value of your practice is leadership. That's right, leadership is one of those areas where you basically are trying to align your team's vision and their mission with your vision and your mission. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a vision statement? Does your team know your mission? If I were to walk into your office today and ask everyone, every one of your team members, what is the vision or mission of your practice, could they answer me? If not, then how do they know where you're going? Do your patients know the direction your organization is heading? I get that it's cliche to say, let's work on our vision and mission. 
but it's one of those things that you can unite and lead an organization to the vision you desire. If you have any questions about how to increase the value of your practice or how to potentially double your net worth every three to five years, reach out to us via FinanciallySimple.com and we'll be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to FinanciallySimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. Well, welcome uh, to this show uh, where we have Chris Mahan of Mahan and Associates. Um, Mahan and Associates is a healthcare business professional firm in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm so glad to have one of the the owners uh, with us, Chris Mahan. Yeah, and, thanks for yeah, coming on welcome, the show. Chris. Hey, thanks guys so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, we've we've known Chris for a long time, and uh, Chris and I go back a number of years. Um, and uh, you know, it's not every day that you talk to somebody who is working so heavily in the dental world from an accounting standpoint. Um, <clears throat> and as I've gotten to know him and kind of what he's up to, uh, it's been really interesting because. I've gotten to see um, some things that have that have kind of evolved a little bit from the outside, watching kind of what's going on in his world a little bit. Um, one of the things that really kind of attracted me to to talking more with Chris on the show was, uh, um, and we'll let him talk about this a little bit, but he, their firm committed to doing a dental continuing education event, a summit, which was became an annual event that uh, was bringing in high-level speakers to educate their clients. And you know, you know, for you guys who listen to the dental guys a lot, you know that that's a big deal to us. You know that continuing education is a big deal. And um, you know, you hear about sometimes your specialists bringing in education, but how often does your, uh, you know, an accounting firm bring in education? Not not just business account, you know, information, but but clinical. And, and for the team, you know, for your hygienist, for your assistants, are they, you know, bringing that kind of level of, of uh, you know, engagement? So that really kind of got me thinking, man, I want to want to find out what makes this, this guy of, tick. Like, what's going on in there? Because whenever you first told me about this, I was like, man, an accounting firm putting on CE where you actually there's a little bit of clinical. There's a little bit of like money stuff, but it was really cool. I thought it was interesting, and um, what I'd like to do first, though, is kind of talk about the journey of yeah, getting Yeah, Chris, it, just tell right? us like who you are uh, and how you got started and how you moved from you know uh, accounting into the healthcare and dentistry world. <laughs> well, I have kind of, I have a very interesting uh, journey. It really started 30 years ago come uh, May 9th, 2020. It will be our 30-year anniversary at Mayhan & Associates. And, you know, by looking at me, you probably can easily identify that I'm not that old. Uh, but now my bro my, <laughs> my older brother, uh, Garland Mahan Jr., uh, he initially started at a regional CPA firm. And they and he helped launch and, and cultivate and develop their health care services segment, specifically at the niche of health care. You know, Nashville is the health care capital of the world. More health care dollars run through Nashville than any other city in the world. Wow. Some could argue Dallas, but you know, I didn't know but, that uh, either way. Um, so my brother Garland jr. Uh, founded the firm in May of 1990. And in 1998, I came through and I was just, you know, bartending, going to college, trying to get some experience. So I started on the front desk and uh, started answering phones and filing and making coffee. And I made it all the way to the top. So I, I was, I was born into it. I didn't, you know, you know, Build it. I, I was born into the healthcare service segment of accounting, tax, and, and those types of strategies. Even though we've really built our organization to add all the additional verticals or service segments that really complement each other for uh, for better results at better cost, aggregately for our clients, and better. Essentially, at the end of the day, it's about return on investment. So that's how yeah. we've gotten started, and we specialize in the healthcare services area. Um, been working with dentists for a very long time and really built our entire service segment on being able to better serve uh, you and, and, and all the dental practices out there. Hmm. So you, so what's your makeup as far as like dentist versus 
other health care providers. Well, you know, originally when I when I joined in 98, um, we were 70, 30 uh, non-dentist to dentist. You know, I say non-dentist to dentist because we have chiropractic, we have op- opto, um, and we, you know, some veterinary. But, you know, but from physicians to dentist, it was a 70, 30 split. But we came up in the world of the the MSOs and the venture capital grabbing up all of the <clears throat> medical practices and the private practices, uh, the specialty practices. And we've been there and seen that happen on two or three cycles where, you know, venture capital, investment, hospitals, et cetera, have come through and grabbed up our clientele and, and, and come back around. So we've pivoted. And while we still are 100 percent, you know, able and, you know, and moving forward with serving that that vertical or that specialty niche inside of our niche, um, dentistry has really just become a natural evolution, especially with, with what's going on in dentistry t- today. It gives us even more capacity, I think, to better advise our clientele on what the current short term and long term benefits and pitfalls of some of the things that are facing dentistry today. Hmm. So did that mean that? So did you make a <clears throat> a concerted effort to um, to kind of look at dentistry and say this is a an area that we we see the the potential or kind of where this is going? You know, is that sort of something that that happened uh, after you had joined in there that kind of started making that a focus? It started organically, you know, just by you know growth of dentistry, <clears throat> and I like to think of our of our service and and return that we were able to provide our clients, you know. Got a lot of really good uh, momentum and velocity through word of mouth because of the job I, I like and I'm proud that we do. Uh, however, then once that started growing, yeah, we started focusing and and more towards dental as a you know a perspective you know addition to our firm in terms of service and and clientele acquisition. So I think you know the thing that's interesting about this is kind of leads to the first question as you become more of a dental specific firm or maybe just a even a healthcare specific firm because there's a lot of nuances in healthcare business Mm -hmm. that um, in its overlap with dentistry and all that kind of thing but the interesting thing is is that there's so many people that are do-it-yourselfers there's a lot of people that are um, maybe like an advisor or a CPA and they just have a few dental clients. But, you know, with that being said, there are tons of CPAs, um, advisors, bookkeepers, practice consultants, all these people. So what value does dental specific advisors have? Because I know there are some, some advantages to this and I've kind of come full circle on this thing myself and uh, but how would you describe the value? Invaluable, <laughs> uh, I think. <laughs> I, th- I think it, in nine point five times out of ten, having the right advisors or the right coaches make all the difference in the world. I mean, you wouldn't go to Don Mattingly to help you learn how to swing your golf club, right? Um, <laughs> And that being said, the higher, you know, specialized they are, the more they're empowered to help you in terms of business operations, in terms of tax planning, in terms of increasing the top of the line, managing the, 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 the overhead, increasing the bottom line, and more importantly, increasing how much of that bottom line you take home. And that can exponentially change somebody's wealth trajectory. Um, got a couple examples, you know, I've had clients that have come from very good, you know, good CPAs that do a lot of good work for, you know, different types of businesses, mom and pop shops, do a lot of tax work through the traditional tax seasons. But, you know, when you look at their financials, they're just standard gap, you know, generally accepted accounting principles, which really don't jump off the page to a lot of clinicians. They look at it and they're like, okay, I see my profits. I see a bunch of expense line items. And then I see my you know, bottom line. Um, and they don't have it set up in a format that they can easily read or more importantly, benchmark to their peers. Uh, benchmarking is a huge thing that, you know, if you benchmark, you know, your practice to your peers, you know, where you stand, which is, you know, a really important thing to do on a monthly or quarterly basis, whether that's in terms of production, hygiene, production, hygiene, you know, compensation to production or adjusted production, um, sundries and supplies as a percentage of revenues, 
uh, labs, et cetera. The list goes on and on. And if you don't have your report set up a certain way, then it can be a, a whole myriad of things that all too often the tradi traditional accounting firms will give you the P&L and the balance sheet, and you're just looking at that bottom line saying, how much do I owe in taxes versus how much more money can I make? Where are the opportunities with my ancillaries or my hygiene? How can I manage my overhead? And then if I increase my EBITDA or my profit margins, how do I make sure more of that hits my pocket? And that's mm. where a dental specific advisor mm. can come in and really help you from, from A to Z in those types of areas. So you're saying it's it's a combination of understanding the business of dentistry, where you actually know, I guess the thing that I relate that to is just knowing what a buildup is, you know, right. knowing yeah. knowing what a an MO composite is, you know, and understanding yeah. those words and then knowing what a lab actually does, you know, right. because heck dude, knowing knowing what a twelve oh eight and a twelve oh six is, exactly. right, Chris? Exactly. I mean, yeah. Well, which one we use today, <laughs> right? Yeah. <clears throat> right. Yeah, that exactly. kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I think that I could see a huge hole in your game if you don't know how to analyze the business. Because it sounds like it's a difference between, you know, accounting, like you say, generally accepted accounting practice. I think that's what the term that you that you mm -hmm. used. Mm -hmm. And and that's basically saying, from what I make make sure I understand this, that's saying this is something that's going to apply to every business, essentially, is that you're going to look at the, you know, what, what the liabilities are and look at what the assets are. And you're going to make sure that, you know, the right amount of tax check gets stroked at the end of the end of the year or whatever, and that people don't get put in jail, you know, and, and that kind of thing, which that's important. That's a starting point. Yep. But you're saying that when you look, so, so give me an idea, like, so somebody comes to you mm -hmm. and they say, all right, so... I, I want to kind of know if if you're a good fit for me. You know, what do you what do you tell somebody who comes to you and says, "All right, Chris, I've I've heard about your firm. I know you guys do a lot of dental. What are you doing with your clients that my accountant is not doing?" And I'm talking about specifically things like, you know, what types of how do you look at tax strategy, for instance? You know, for a dental office versus another type of business? I know that's a very, very broad question, but give us maybe some examples of some things you look at in dentistry from a tax standpoint that you maybe don't look at in, say, like a dry cleaning operation or something like that. Right. Well, you know, with dentistry and healthcare specifically, there's so many tax deductions that are out there that can be utilized that traditional advisors, CPAs, enrolled agents, they just, by their, their school of compliance, will not entertain, you know, utilizing that scope when there's so much application to dental that so many times is left on the table. So the first thing that we do whenever I have a prospective client come to me, you know, first I want to hear their story. Hey, what is your story? And what are you, you know, of course, you know, what are you not getting that you need? And then when it comes to the objective assessment, I want to look at their financial statements to make sure it's not some generic QuickBooks, you know, print off that has 76,000 GL, you know, accounts, general ledger accounts that doesn't make any sense. And it's even hard for me to read. And I'm a seasoned veteran where, yeah. you know, I'm like, man, they're not getting any valuable information out of this other than bottom line and all, all the opportunities in the middle. Right. So I'll look at their, their format of their financials, how often they're getting their financials. I'll also look at their tax returns. And we do something called a tax crusher. And it's just, the, it's just the traditional things of, you know, employing your children. Are you utilizing home office? You would be surprised how many times I'll get clients that aren't even utilizing home office deductions. And if you're not utilizing home office deductions, then you can't utilize mileage from your home office to your office. And there are, there are, there are <clears throat> court cases, there are rulings that allow dentists to do this. And you'd be surprised how many practitioners, tax practitioners, don't allow or don't promote or teach their clients on how to turn that into their favor, which can add thousands and thousands of dollars to their bottom line just in that one year and in subsequent years. And you know, the, the value of compounding is if I can add three to $4,000 in tax savings on just a few things a year, the rest of it's gravy. And so, mm. you know, you look at those traditional things that are leaving on the table, not to mention, you know, are they doing 
you know, I, I, you know, two eighty a, you know, self rental of the primary residence. Are they doing, you know, what are what are they doing? And so we'll look at those different items um, and see exactly how they've been utilized in the past. And complimentary, we'll say here are the missed deductions you have on your return. If you filed your return with these deductions, this would be your tax savings. Let me know if you want to talk further. And so I have a case study of a client that came to me. With, uh, was with a non-dental CPA, very good CPA, smart guy, probably smarter than me, actually. Um, you know, oh, actually smarter than me. Um, but that <laughs> we recognized in our tax crusher, just in missed deductions, because they weren't applying certain strategies the right way, $28,000 a year in tax. Man. Aid. And this isn't one of those clients that's, you know, doing $3 million a year, right? So, it, you know, it's the pretty much, you know, average, average, for lack of a better words, Joe Dental Office, just missing those deductions or not incorporating how they do business. The tax code is a roadmap for us to all play the game the way the IRS wants us to. And if you look at it as an opportunity versus a have to or a, oh my gosh, I hate the tax code, I hate the IRS, they're laying out the playbook saying, if you do it this way, we understand that you guys are, business owners are the shoulders that this country stands on. Play the game this way, and we'll make sure you, you get a lot of tax breaks. So. Hmm. so it's pretty common, would you say, that when you see people come to you just from a tax standpoint, not even getting into the business side of things, but <clears throat> just from a tax standpoint, is it's pretty common that you're seeing a lot of missed opportunities there? Like, is that is that, I mean, is it almost every time? Is it very common? It is almost every time there, there has been, I'll tell you, I've all I've done, we've done literally hundreds of these and I've had two that I've, I've sent them back saying, Hey, high five your tax professional. They are doing <laughs> top tier work. Hmm. Hmm. And that, that says a lot to hmm. me, you know, Wes, is that, I mean, I know that <clears throat> so many times on this show, we're talking about the clinical side and we're going to get into that because I think that this dovetails right into that with the business side, but you know, I think that man, you can be in the trenches, and I mean, here's here's what I here's what I kind of used to think that you could do. I used to think, well, I'll get a couple of newsletters, you know, from like some of these big name <laughs> people, uh, and and you know, everybody knows who I'm talking about. There's a couple of big firms that put out some newsletters, you know, and they do some CE stuff. Dewey, John, and, Dewey, uh, <laughs> and then I thought, well, okay, I could maybe pass those along to a to an accountant who who was just an accountant and I'd kind of say hey here's mm. here's some stuff you know so can like Go can figure you figure out, this out right <laughs> and I mean it seems like Chris that's not easy to do you know you, you set you tell like a typical accountant here I got this article that I just printed off for you I mean, what what do they even do with that? It seems like it would be hard for them to even, without understanding well, the, the business, can they really do much with that? Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I think that's a great question, but let's kind of make it more specific, is what makes dentistry so special, mm -hmm. right? Like, what is it so special about what we're doing that you provide such a great service for? Well, I don't know... If Dentistry is so special other than the fact that we've hyper intensively focused on the tax code and the applications of dentistry and how to use it in a different way. And to speak back to John's point, hmm. it's kind of like me walking into, you know, let's pick something, you know, uh, Joe Blow DDS, who, you know, has done zero CE and, you know, demand, you know, bought a practice 10 years ago and just being doing crown and bridge the whole time. If I walk in with an all on four article and say, can you do this? They're going to be like, no, that's not the right treatment for you because they don't understand that world. Right. <laughs> if mm. I go in and say, you know, right. I, you know, in hybrid dentures, I mean, it's the same thing. You know, I, if I want to do that, can you do this? And it's not something they're familiar with. A lot of times they're just going to default back to what their bread and butter is and what they know and what they've experienced results on versus what may or may not be the very best clinical and, and, and cosmetic application that's out there now, right? Yeah. So it comes down to how much, you know, they're, they've been sharpening their saw and how they can apply it too. And then, you know, Wes, back to your point, dentistry is a beautiful area that there are so many applications that, again, got carved out, that people just discarded over the years thinking there's no application to, to dental with that. And I'll give you one of the best examples um, was the domestic production activities deduction. 
Back in mm. the late nineties, you know, Congress passed the DPAD or Domestic Production Activities Deduction to stimulate domestic manufacturing, right? And everybody goes, man, how would that ever work? You know, that 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 never worked with dental. And then here comes CAD cam technology, and we got we got the CEREC red cam, and then we got the blue cam, and then we got you know, and you know, CEREC or E4D or whatever the case may be, where we're manufacturing crowns and inlays in on, in our office. And then you bring in the 3D technology, and we're manufacturing guided implants. And now we're manufacturing with with 3D printers, all kinds of other stuff. That those things were just left on the table with probably 90% of tax advisors out there. And if your tax advisors were doing it, then man, you need to go give them a high five, saying thank you for being forward thinking, even if they were doing it up until the last year of 2017 to do it right, because. Hmm. We would go through with practices that were doing any types of ortho, whether that's six month smile or full bands and brackets, or whether they're doing, they're doing implants, or if they're doing CAD CAM technology, and we've been able to get refunds on amending prior year returns of up to fifty two thousand dollars, and every single one of them has never been questioned by the Internal Revenue Service. And I'm knocking on wood right now because I'll probably get a letter tomorrow. <laughs> no, no, but uh. But that being said, and I, and I welcome that letter because we did our due diligence on that deduction and had it tied up, you know, across the board. And so, just a note to any people that are anybody that's listening, we've we've already lost a year, and that was kind of the easy walk in for us. Is if you we do if we go back and look at your returns and you are not taking advantage of the domestic production activities deduction, we'll look and see if you were doing any any ortho implants or CAD CAM, you know, in house. Uh, crowns and we'll go and amend three years well 18 just got filed so we lost so we lost a year we still can get amends 16 and 17 uh so you still have two years left if you've done any of that give us a call and we'll look at it also some some uh tax preparers were utilizing the d-pad which i i applaud them because most weren't but they were only doing it for CEREC or or in-house produced uh crowns when they didn't go the extra mile going ooh. If you take a band and a bracket, that makes an orthodontic appliance in one's mouth, you know, okay? Or if you take an implant and the components that go with that, that is manufacturing because you're taking two or more independent products and making something different. And there's all kinds of IRS white papers, rulings, and those things out there that substantiate that, and we've been very successful in doing it. And that's an example of what we've done in the past. Well, I, I hear that. I hear that kind of thing when you give just a couple of examples, and I think... You know, here's these types of deductions that if you understand, you know, you take a tax law, like you said, that is applied to industry. Yeah. And you you find out how that applies to dentistry. And and you also, it sounds like you said when you mentioned doing your due diligence, you know, there's there's also some people pushing the limits, mm -hmm. right? And they're doing things because that's what everybody because I think sometimes people hear that kind of stuff and they and you were you were careful to mention that. Hey, there's I there's cases out there of the IRS has looked at this stuff and they've said this is legit. But but on one hand, you got people who are not doing anything. You know, they're just kind of doing the general, like you say, generally accepted practices, mm -hmm. and we're leaving stuff on the table. But there's also some people that are doing some some stuff that might be borderline illegal or not or illegal. So how what do you tell somebody who says, I hear all this and I think, man, this this, you know, I don't know, this sounds like it's fringe or am I gonna get, you know, put in jail for this or audited? You know, what what is it about what you guys are doing that that makes somebody feel comfortable that that they're in the, you know, in the right place as far as the, you know, following the letter of the law? That, that, that's a that's a great question because I agree. A lot of times, you know, I can get on a stage or, or on a podcast or have our own sessions and talk about all the great things we can do with pretty much any client in terms of their tax savings. But when you look at the bottom line aggregately, and, you know, if I get on the stage and I use a case study where somebody was able to fully fund their 401k plan and their defined benefit plan and walked away with $20,000 more in their pocket by utilizing tax strategy than they otherwise would have, a lot of times, you know, the old, old premise is if it sounds too good to be tr true, many times it is, right? So, mm. um, and that's so that's a great question. So, what I would what I would recommend is, hey, look how long a firm has been in business. One, that's always a good start. Get references too, and ask them about any audit challenges they've had on any of their specific strategy, and how those turned out. 
And if they can't mm. provide you any of those things, then you know that that might give you some question or some some area for pause. But you do you want to do your mm. due diligence with your tax professional just like you do with anyone else. But I, I guarantee you that you know finding the right one, you know, and and as long as is is you do your due diligence on again references, how long they've been in the game, what are you know what are your past three audits that got changed and why? I think those are the questions to ask. Um, because I don't have to tell you a specific client, but I can say we've got a 95% audit rating. That means that 9.5 out of every audit that come through, come, come back with no changes. So you say, well, what about the 0.5? And I'll say, well, Dr. Joe gave a hundred thousand dollars a year in non-cash charitable contributions because <laughs> Dr. Joe's wife goes and spends a lot of money and then just gives it all to Goodwill. And this is just an example, right? And so, when we put those dollar amounts at fair market value on their Schedule A, you know, those can be contested by the IRS. So, I mean, I have examples, but those are the questions you want to ask and the feedback you want to get um, in terms of identifying, you know, if, if you feel good about it. Um, and, here's the, and here's the gold. Here's the, here's the deal right here. Whether it's mileage, whether it's taking your auto and depreciating that brand new car you're going to buy, you know, this year. For, and also you want to maximize tax deductions because you never got to take depreciation or car washes, or gas and oil, you know, here's, here it is. It's about documentation, documentation, documentation. So we will mm -hmm. not file a return or take a strategy unless we have so much documentation behind it that it's, it's irrefutable. Now, on the personal side, Dr. Joe and the charitable contributions, I can't challenge that. I can't put systems in place. But Dr. Joe knows that that's on him and how much information he gave us. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. So uh, it is uh, exactly like in the end, it's still a responsibility of the person f who has got the sign in their name to the, uh, you know, the tax, uh, the tax return here, which is, you know, the individual, cl the client mm -hmm. to, you know, do their due diligence as well. Right. And I think, you know, we can't rely on our tax professionals to, you know, make up for our past mistakes or our sins, you know. And I think that that sometimes is what happens is people are like, well, I want you to, I want you to get me out of a jam, you know, and, I, and obviously that's not, that's not going to happen. But I think that most people, most dentists who are, you know, listening to this show are, uh, are thinking right now, they're thinking, man, you know, I, I don't know that I'm, I'm, I might be leaving some stuff on the table here. And when you mention somebody like a typical guy who's leaving $28,000 a year, uh, on the table. And then when you mentioned something, which, you know, you said something there that was really high level yep. and didn't really expand on it, but you said max net your 401k and a defined benefit plan and basically ended up with also more money in the bank. And I just, for a second, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that has real value. I mean, you want to talk about changing somebody's life. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can, I mean, how, Chris, how much money can you put away in a defined benefit plan per year if you're already maxed at your 401k? Well, it comes down to how much money the practice is making in terms of profitability, but you're looking anywhere on average from 75 to an additional 100 grand a year on top of the, let's just call it 60 grand that was in the 401k. So instead of putting away 5,000 in an IRA or, you know, 12, five in a simple plan, think about how fast and how rapidly your retirement grows when you're knocking down a hundred and a quarter. And here's the beautiful thing. Oh. If you're doing it with tax savings, and, you know, and, and, and John and Wes, y'all bring great points to the table, but here's it is. I can't come in and magic wand it for 2018, but for 2019 and then 2020, it's all about building your business apparatus around doing things mm. a specific way and documenting it. And if you do that, yep. man, you can let the tax code pay for everything. Just like, you know, this young dentist out of Effingham let the tax code pay for his acquisition of 600 practices. <laughs> you know, I mean, let, Man. let the tax code work for you, you know. Well, it seems like you're, you know, where you're coming from here is that you've got the tax side of this covered, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, from what I'm what I'm hearing. I mean, but, but, but from what you've told me in the past, that's, I mean, obviously that's a major part of what you guys do, but in a way it's kind of just a, I don't want to say a small part, but it's a, it's a part. Right. But you guys have got a lot more going on from the business side. So I want you to speak a little bit to that. You know, you said you you kind of used the words earlier, full service, right. you know, and that you guys offer kind of a little bit of everything. So 
So talk a little bit about that because I think people are going to be kind of surprised to hear uh, what all you got your firm offers and what what maybe that the benefits of having a kind of more of a full service quote unquote firm that's it's looking at your business as well as your tax. Sure. Um, well, thanks. You know, one of the first things we do is we have ongoing relationships with our clients. So we're always looking at their financial statements and we're looking at them from a couple different levels. Their production comparatively, comparatively year to year. Is it stagnant? Are there additional service segments that we can do? Are you doing sleep apnea? Are you doing implants? Are you are you referring out all your endo? I mean, what are you, what can we do or what CE can we invest in to increase restorative production? Uh, how about our ancillary? Our, our, is our hygiene department producing 30 to 35 percent of our adjusted production? And is our hygiene doing fluoride? Are they doing perio? Are they doing sealants? You know, are they doing anterior PAs? What are they doing in their service segment that we can increase hygiene production and profitability? We also look at compensation for, you know, hygiene to their adjusted production. Note that I said adjusted production. Everybody used to look at gross production, and that's something that we're moving towards because historically hygiene was always basically reimbursed at a high level, even through the PPOs of their UCR. That's not the case anymore. You know, you got Delta and Blue Cross that are giving you 15 and 20 percent haircuts on a profi. So, you know, you got to know those things and make sure that the profit centers of ancillaries are good. The overarching, you know, pro productivity of the business is growing. And if it's not, is that due to lack of service additions, service segments, referrals out, new patients in, the old patients out? Do we have an attrition problem? So we really try to increase that top of the line or the revenues component, right? That's the first thing we look at when we're going through a financial statement. The next thing we look at are how much are you paying out in salaries and wages? How much are administrative staff? How much are our clinical staff or assistants? How much are non-doctor providers or hygienists? And, you know, the industry average runs from 27 and a half to 28 and a half, somewhere in there. You know, a lot of people target 25. We like to target below 25 percent as a percentage of your dollars going out in, in terms of total revenues. So are you optimizing your return on investment? And if not, where are we inflated? And if we are inflated, what is our action plan to fix that? And there's a couple ways to do that. We look at Hey, if we need to get these percentages more in line, we need to do more production. That brings the percentages down. To get our percentages in line, we may have inherited, you know, some older tenured, you know, staff that are, you know, highly compensated because they were part of the old every year a dollar methodology. And they stayed for 30 years, so they were making $50 an hour. And you kind of got stuck with that, <laughs> you know. But we build those systems and plans to get those more in line and more comparable to where we need to have those efficiencies. We look at your What you're describing – yeah, what you're describing right here, let me interrupt you just for a second, is what the industry is liking to call these key uh, performance indicators, KPIs. Mm -hmm. and let me just say this is that I walked into a the largest, um, I, I was speaking uh, recently at the largest distributor or sales force for Verizon, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, I won't name the company's name, but they just, they basically sell more cell phones as a reseller than any other company in the United States. And so I walked into their, let's call it the war room, okay, mm -hmm. because everything was KPI'd. Mm -hmm. Like, and I really got like super duper excited about it because it was real time tracking. It was right in your face. And it was so much of what you're talking about here these things can be tracked dentally. And I think we're a little bit behind in dentistry in doing this. And um, you're telling us that there's so many things you can track and just doing those things. Um, what does it do for you? Well, there's a guy named Peter Drucker. and He was the father of modern management. He <laughs> is the guy that every <laughs> MBA you know, studies the books, et cetera, et cetera. And it basically- it's right here. I'm just put. I'm putting it up in my video. Feed, I was going to say, uh, John, there it is, right here, Chris. If you look over there, <laughs> nice. Say, yeah, it's yeah. right, sitting right by me. Yeah. The effective executive. Yeah. Right? If you measure it, it will improve, and that's everything. That's yep. from new patients, the patient attrition, to production by provider. If you, more you measure it, the 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 more it'll improve. Just like your weight, you know, if you're sitting there and every day you get on the scale, you're not going to walk to the doctor on your annual checkup and go, "Oh gosh, I gained 30 pounds this year," right? Right. Um, so you measure it daily or as rapidly as you can, especially on the, on the, on the primary ones, the heartbeat of the practice. And How rapidly you know, those, are, you, are you promoting measuring these now? Man, a lot of them are daily. 
And that's just basically production to goal, collections to goal, new patients to goal, patient attrition, Google and Facebook reviews, surveys through Revenue Well or Smile Reminder, um, or, or whatever you know you may be utilizing. I said Smile Reminder. That's an old school term. Um, but you know, demand force. Are you helping dentists? Are you helping dentists implement ways to do this? How are you? How are yeah. you helping dentists to get <clears throat> to that? Um, depending on what their needs are, I mean, I can help them set up, you know, in, in their Dentrix or their Eagle Soft or their Open Dental. There's there's different ways you can set up goals and and it'll track it daily if you know how to work the the system the right way. Um, I mean, even at some point, you know, you got the you know you, you got Scottsdale Center that used to be you know Mercer back in the day, and they sold their practice management platform to EagleSoft, and there for a while, EagleSoft had the Mercer the Mercer trackers behind on EagleSoft, and nobody even knew it, right? Just because wow, knew I didn't know it. that. Did you know that, John? That's crazy. No, never heard. I of didn't that. know yep. that. Yep, you know Mercer was like huge. MTIs was huge on the trackers, which you know what? I dig it. Initially, when I was a young consultant, I was like, oh, that's putting so much work on the staff. Well, guess what? It makes them buy in and makes them own their current areas. And that's why MTIs mm -hmm. probably has a much bigger house than mine, right? Um, right. <laughs> and that's where that's why now MTIs is basically Spear yeah. has essentially, you know, become now they have a whole practice management division mm -hmm. that's that's headed up by that guy or kind of headed up by him. He's kind of in the background because and, and they have developed a back-end tracking, uh, you know, solution for this exact reason because he believes, just as, you know, Sally McKenzie believed and all these folks that have kind of developed this over so many years that, as you said, I mean, if you don't measure it, and there's just nothing quite like having these numbers visible. Yeah. You know, we, yeah. we meet once a, once a month and we have a, a Excel spreadsheet, essentially, that, you know, my team has a certain line items that they're responsible for and this all came from sally mckenzie stuff and you know you have to you know the financial coordinator is responsible for the following you know eight metrics and she has to read those things and say you know our collections our ar was this our collections our outstanding insurance over 60 days is this and you know here's what the the benchmark is mm -hmm. and it is amazing how just saying those words out loud or having those numbers you know posted why do you think Chris, because I want to have a whole show on KPI, so I don't want to go super deep into the granular side of each one because I want to talk more about that. Yeah. Why do you think dentists have a hard time with putting up numbers yes. for the team? Great question, John. Great question. Well, there's a reason why MTIs and, and Sally are two of the most successful and best consultants out there. I mean, I, I give them props. They're 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 leaders to this, and I think they both recognize as do I is that you know what dentistry is not easy. It is emotionally, it is mentally, it is physically fatiguing, and most clinicians have families and outside things they want to do, so they don't have. They're not afforded the luxury, or a lot of times the uh, the uh, physical, you know, capacity. Which that's no slant. I mean, it takes a different machine to be able to see their sit their chair side and put ten thousand dollars of restorative on the board, deal with ongoing day-to-day -day, you know sales reps coming in patients getting mad bad facebook reviews employee wanting off work another employee wanting to raise to sit back and update their excel spreadsheet you know on their day off or after five o'clock so i think the key to it is identifying a third-party coach or accountability partner that can really pull that legwork off the practice whether that third party is you know again an outside firm such as mayhan or mtis or whoever or at least somebody on the team. And, you know, John, you brought a good point up that, you know, at your staff meetings, because, you know, if you really like delivering the magic, it's a story about Disney. That is how Disney was cultivated. It's about accountability and key reports. Everybody on the team has their key report that they report to at their meetings, and that's how you hold everybody accountable. And then, you know, you get into the Simon Sinek, it all starts with the why. So if you share with them, we're going to track these metrics on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, and this is why, um, and then you have it assigned either internally or externally, you can get that data very rapidly and it turns that, that data into knowledge, right? But don't you think that dentists struggle with just telling their, their production team about, about the numbers yeah, like he, in general, like what it's like, it's like we don't like, we think that if we tell them, 
about the they're numbers gonna know that, what we make oh no or, or they they're going to know what we make or they're or they're going to they're going to figure out what about, somebody's getting paid you know right or they're going to just think it's all about money now it's all about but but chris tell you know how do you respond to that if somebody you try you're trying to develop yeah, this what would you idea say? of kpis in a practice and somebody says well i mean you know my team's just going to think it's all about money and numbers and what do you say to them well, you now there's an old guy named Walter Haley, and he's the one that founded the Dental Boot Camp. A lot of people have heard of Dental Boot Camp, and uh, yeah, man, Dental Boot Camp. Steve Anderson with Crown Council and Tops Total, you know, patient service, and and Suzanne Black, who now has the boot camp. They all cut their teeth and came up under with Walter Haley. And you listen to Walter Haley's, you know, speeches, and you know he came in and he'd sit at a dental office and he'd say, you know, everybody's here, and like, you don't like the sale word. He goes, if you don't like the S word, you're not gonna, you're gonna live with the B word, and that's broke, right? And he says, we are a <laughs> functioning, viable business in the pay, in the, in the business of clinical care and great clinical service and patient service. Um, but until you understand that this is a business, and that's where it really comes down to a deep dive and a and a and a. Mm-hmm rebirth i guess with a lot of the team members and you're going to have some of those legacy team members that are like oh they just care about the money well guys the money is something that we all care about because it is a business um but you know we want to make sure that we optimize our business by offering ancillary service segments i mean you know offering ancillary product offering different levels of service um without just you know going through and scorched earth you know pulling every tooth in somebody's head i mean so there's a right way to do it and, and I think if you communicate the why and the how and make sure that everybody knows that we're building this together at the highest ethical and, you know, clinically ethical standards out there, it's easy to get everybody behind you. And, you know. And yeah, and that's, a, yeah. that's the big thing, yeah. man. It's, it's all about being, being real about it, being ethical about it. I mean, that's, that's why we like, I think one of the reasons I connected with you early on was, you know, that I, I saw kind of your, your focus was, yeah, like we, we, yeah, we're going to make more money. Like that's great, but it was making more money because you're doing it right. Right. And I think that's why it resonates with what, <clears throat> you know, we're preaching on our show, which is, well, next you know, level, I mean, right, we, John? I mean, it's yeah, about taking, taking it to the next yeah, level and whatever that right, is, right? Doing and it I right. And I think that, you know, in general, when you do a good job and you commit, you know, you said one of the very first things you said, Chris, when we asked about how the business side works and what do you tell somebody you basically said, hey, let's look at what you're not doing. Sleep apnea, implants, what's your hygiene team? And then you said, let's find the right CE so that you can do that and therefore increase your production, which then is one of the quickest and easiest ways to get those KPIs in line uh, is, to, is to decrease the percentages by increasing your production. And I think that's kind of the way that Wes and I have looked at at these services that we provide, you know, if you do it right, pursue the right educational pathway and have somebody that's holding you accountable right. to actually understand the business. Cause you can't just say, you know, Oh, I'm going to go take all the CE in the world. That doesn't mean you're going to be successful in business. Right. But, but I think it's, it's pretty common that when you take the right CE and you learn how to do things the right way and you're providing excellent care, I mean, it's kind of hard to argue with that from a team standpoint. It's kind of hard to argue with it from, with, from a business standpoint, but it sounds like unless you have somebody, whether it's you or whether it's your office manager or whether it's somebody that's a third party, which really understands the business side of it. I mean, you, you could, you could be the smartest guy in the room, the best clinician in the room, but you might, you might be missing some stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I echo that. I mean, you know, Right now, what what are the two one of two of the two of the biggest epidemics in the, in in the country from a or 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 systemic leaders to epidemics in the country other than you know obstructive sleep breathing or sleep apnea, which is the gateway that's I mean right down the pocket of dentistry and I'll just share with you I, I think I can say this and if not they'll edit it out but we were doing our very first dental summit and in the same hotel resort here in Nashville, Heartland was having their regional meeting. Well, I went outside, you know, get a, you know, to get a, you know, a bottle of water, and they had their door open. So I peeked in, and it said sleep apnea, the next frontier. And I was like, boom! If they're doing it, we need to tell our people to do it, you know. And I'm saying, <clears> but <throat> that's something that's yeah. ethical that you can really get behind and pioneer and champion if it fits what you want to do and your clinical, you know, strengths and and practice strengths. The other thing is perio, which has been systemically linked to what cancer, cardiovascular disease. 
Um, and now Alzheimer. I mean, how can you not take that, on, you know, and take that as something? And, you know, you talk about it's about the CE, whether you go out and get it somewhere with your teams, whether you bring the Wendy Briggs into your office and where she can help teach them and champion them and sway them to doing it the way that, you know, a certain way. And it's also about investment in technology. Do you have the laser, the soft tissue laser that the hygiene can come in and do the, you know, and do the laser therapy? Are they laser certified? Does it make it fun for them? Do you give them a reason to champion? You know, or again, you know, what is it? Was the study last week? 50%. In Great Britain, there's 50, oral cancer is up 50% more than it was year over year, right? So then people are like, oh, hmm. wow, maybe we need to start doing the oral cancer screenings. You know, So there's so many opportunities out there for your team to get behind and say, this is what I want to champion. What do y'all want to champion? And it helps us add something to our service menu, increase production, increase, you know, increase value in people's lives, and we all make money. That's a trifecta. Yeah, and I, I think that's great. I yeah, think that's I think great it's awesome. because in the end, I mean, if you just do what you would do for your family, that's right. To all of your patients, you're going to produce more dentistry, guys. That's it. I mean, if you look at a quadrant of old amalgams and they're falling apart, and it was your wife or your husband or your whatever, your mom, you're probably going to replace those. You know, if you if you're if there's a if you got a bunch of four millimeter pockets and bleeding, you're probably gonna do some scaling root planning. You know, I mean, and, and yet for some reason in our own practices, we're not putting the fluoride on the patient who just had four cavities last year. Right. You know, and I feel like it's interesting once you just get people behind that idea of just do do what you would do for yourself, do what you would do for your family. It seems like the production side of it kind of starts to take care of itself if the clinical skills are there to back up what you're recommending that the patient does. Yeah. It's asymptomatic of doing the doing doing that job precisely. And another point I'd echo is never, ever, ever, <clears throat> ever let insurance dictate what you walk out. Right? Whoa. Mm. Or what you do and how you do it. Do it your way. So what you're right saying, way. Chris, what you're saying, Chris, <laughs> is the key here is not to take on more insurance. Mm. To grow your think, practice? Because everything oh. you've said has nothing to do with insurance. I think that that's, that's not, it depends. And I hate it when I get that answer from my attorneys. <laughs> but no, it, it depends because it's a demographic specific. But no, but back to your statement, Wes. Yeah, you can do a ton in your office, a ton without taking on more insurance. And, you know, and a lot of people mm -hmm. want to be fee for service. Well, one thing I will strongly caution against is going through and they're you know cutting PPOs and saying we're going to be fee for service now and we're going to do more you know so there each practice has its own specific demographics in terms of population employers in the area and those kind of things but back to your statement Wes 100% there are so many things that we can add on as adjunct fee for service services that you don't have to take on more insurance there is a gold mine underneath each dental office I promise you. And that's in terms. Well, of I think we need to have you back on to talk. Care. I think we need yeah. to have you back on to talk a little bit more about these gold mine opportunities. Yeah, yeah, and the KPIs. And I really want to. I'd love to think dive that'd be into a great episode. Yeah, some tell specifics. Us, tell us a little that. bit about where people can find you now, and maybe how they could reach out to you before we close the show. Sure. Well, we're we're in, we're headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee, and we serve clients all over the country. Um, have that we're blessed with that opportunity, and. You can reach out to me at Chris, C-H-R-I-S, at Mahan, M-A-H-A-N, associates.com. Check out our website, MahanAssociates.com. Call our office at 615-883-7800, and we'd be happy to talk to you, do a complimentary tax crusher, and a complimentary, you know, just conversation. We'll see if we're the right fit, and if we are, let's see what we can do. And if not, hey, man, cheers, and wish you the best of luck moving forward. But we're all in this together, and... Your success is our success, and let's go get them. Awesome. awesome. That's awesome. Well, I think uh, if, if you're, you know, if you don't have, if, if you've been thinking about this, you know, and, 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 you know, Chris is not paying us to say this. Let me just tell you. <laughs> like, we just have him on the show, guys. Like, we know him. We know he's doing it right, and we thought that we'd like to share some knowledge. But if you don't have anybody or you have somebody that you're questioning, you know, you might want to give them a call. You know, give somebody a call. 
who knows what they're doing. I think if you if you've heard anything today, it's find some find trusted advisors that you feel like are going to make you a better business person, a better mm. dentist potentially, and maybe help you retire a few, a few years earlier. So give somebody a call. And if and I think that definitely, you know, this this firm has got it got it right. And I want you right now to hop on our socials and give us your love. Uh, connect with us. Tell us what you thought about this episode. Tell us what you thought about what some of the things Chris has had to say. You know, do you do you agree with them? Do you disagree with them? Tell us what you want to hear more about. And we have Chris back. We'd love to get your feedback on. You know, what are some of the areas in business or accounting, or just as, from a standpoint of partnership with advisors that you want to hear more about? Because that's the thing. We're going to have opportunities to talk more with Chris about those things, and we want you to connect with us. Hop on Twitter, hop on Facebook, hop on Instagram. We're, we're active. We're live on there. We'll get back with you with questions that you might ask. And once again, thanks a lot, Chris, for being on the show. It's been a lot of fun. We look forward to having you back, talking more about this. So for Wes, for Chris, I'm John, and we are The Dental Guys. Yeah.